the Wade Center's podcast. The podcast of Wheaton College. Uh, the, the wonderful scene where Gandalf faces down the Witch King and he says, you know, old king, you cannot enter. But then after they had this face off, they hear the horns in the background that Rowan has arrived. Mm. There's this mm. horns, 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 the writers of Rowan. That L- Lewis, when he heard that read aloud in the Inklings meeting, he wept. He was oh, just so wow. touched by the idea that they're coming to the rescue at the last moment. Hello, this is Crystal Downing, and I am joined by my co-director at the Wade Center, David Downing, and our podcast producer, Aaron Hill, to continue on our conversation about The Lord of the Rings. We are moving on to book five, which is the first half of The Return of the King, and I understand David, that this wasn't the title that Tolkien originally chose. Well, as we discussed, he had in mind a big, thick epic like Dune, and the publishers in the 50s wanted him to split it into three. So it's not a real trilogy. He didn't necessarily like the two towers because he didn't think people would understand which two towers he was referring to. And he didn't like the Return of the King because he thought it gave away too much. He wanted to call the third one the War of the Ring. Oh. So it's a bit confusing because he wrote in six books, but it's divided into three physical books. But he would have preferred that this be called the War of the Ring. You mean this book five would have been called that? No, the, or the, the, whole the third, third one in the series okay. instead of Return of the King. I, I mean, I like that title, although Return of the King is, you know, really good. But I, I like the War right. of the Ring. That's kind of neat. Yeah. Actually, I don't think the title Return of the King gives away too much because there's so many different possibilities of what king is he talking about. And so there's this repeated reference throughout today's reading of um, the return of someone. And you go, oh, is it Theoden? Is it Denethor? Is it... Mm. Um, yeah, there is more than one king in the story. Well, yeah. Denethor is not actually a king. He's a steward. Yes. He's yes. taking care of the throne yes. until Aragorn arrives. Right. But he wants his son to become king, right? But I would say, David, anybody who's been paying attention through the first two, well, the first four books, uh, first two novels, is going to... I mean, it's not like anybody's not... Ex- who's not expecting Aragorn to become king over Gondor, right? That's true. I don't know uh, how else you would end the story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it feels like that's an, an inevitability in the story, so it's not like but you're spoiling anything. are you saying that because you know what's going to happen? I don't think it's necessarily clear-cut. For example, here is a statement in today's reading about Faramir, um, and Tolkien writes of Faramir, here was one with an air of high nobility, uh, such as Aragon at, time, at times revealed, less high perhaps, yet also less incalculable and remote, one of the kings of men. So mm. Faramir could have been the king, and he literally does return. He mm-hmm. al- almost returns from the dead, as, as we later see. Oh, I'm sorry. Our time is up for that topic. <laughs> Thank you so much for your comments. Well, uh, but I just, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like he sets it up so much in uh, the first novel and then his, uh, you know, he has a couple transformational moments for Aragorn in the in the two towers that it, it almost, I mean, it, it seems pretty obvious to me when I was reading through it the first time that that was what, what was going to happen. I mean, especially well, even good in for this you. book. Aren't you a perceptive reader? <laughs> No, I'm saying in, in this book, even uh, Gandalf is like telling Pippin, you know, don't, you know, don't let it slip oh, yeah. about Aragorn. Right. Don't mention anything. We don't want to, you know, throw off Denethor. I mean, it's it's there in the novel throughout the stories. I, it's not like it's, I think everybody's expecting it. It's the payoff that is. Yeah, the, it's how it all comes. Exactly. Up into, into, that's happened true of a lot of stories. It's not what happens, but how it happens. Yeah. yeah. Right, uh, right. How it unfolds. In fact, I talk about that uh, in my book on film, how often people will say spoiler alert, <laughs> which is a very naive way to talk about film because film is so much more than the plot. Yeah. It's how the plot is put together. That's the art. Yeah. And the same thing I would say about Lord of the Rings. It's how it's put together. Yeah. Even if some of us snotty people think that it's obvious Aragorn <laughs> is uh, the king being talked Goodness about. Gracious. I don't think that it's necessarily the case. Yeah. Well, in the sixth sense, the uh, detective was one of the dead people. Oh, David, spoiler alert. Well, Come see, on. there you go. See? <laughs> Sometimes you really don't know, want to know the ending. Well, I would say, uh, in my defense, Tolkien goes out of his way to hide Eowyn's role in the battle until you yes. know, the very moment. Right. And so there are 
times in the story where he does very clearly try and hide what he's doing and, you know, surprise you at the last moment. And but he does. I don't feel like he tries to do that with Aragorn. So it, it doesn't feel like it was with spoilers. It's inevitable. No. It's almost fated to be king. Yeah. Well, there's also a prophecy he'll become king. And in the Lord yeah. of the Rings world, prophecies come true. Yeah. And dreams have meaning. Yeah. So uh, there's just too much there to feel like it it would be a surprise to anybody. Yeah. I was just listening to our last podcast and it's interesting in, in book four, you had this kind of close up on Sam and Frodo and Gollum. And suddenly in book five, the camera pulls back. We have these wide angle scenes yeah, and big yeah. battles and big, the muster of great troops. So uh, yes, but we will find out that inevitably Aragorn, not Aragorn, but Aragorn. Yeah. Uh, people say Aragorn because of Catherine of Aragorn. Oh. Uh, and when he has the healing, uh, Herb, it's not tarragon. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Thank look, you. It does look like that. Although I will say that it feels like Tolkien ran out of names for men in Gondor there because it's like Hergon and Targon and just <laughs> kind of gets in. Yeah, just <laughs> Baragon. And they, just, well, they all mean something. Uh, Baragon means valiant man of Gondor. Oh, okay. All Gond right. means stone. So Gondor is the city of stone. Uh, well, we should probably start with the beginning since we're getting yeah. ahead of ourselves. Well, let's talk about Minas Tirith, the first chapter. Okay. Right. Uh, so they get to the White City. And I like how Tolkien... Uh, uses the perspective of Merry and Pippin through the book. Right. Uh, so you're seeing events unfold from their perspective and instead of Gandalf's perspective or, uh, you know, other characters in the story. So I thought that was very interesting to see the city through Pippin's eyes as right. he comes into it. Well, he usually uses the point of view of a humble character. Yeah. So first we'll see things through Frodo's eyes or Sam's mm -hmm. eyes. And once we get to this section, there's this beautiful symmetry. It's very cin cinematic. Here's what's going on with Rowan and Mary. Here's what's going on with Gandalf at Minas Tirith yeah. and Pippin. Minas Tirith means Tower of Watching. Oh, okay. The tier means watching or to look. It's the same root as the Palantir, which can look um, everywhere. Um. So all these names, they're not made up. The reason for the repetition is because they all mean something gotcha. in Gondor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, and also what is interesting is he starts us off in the very first chapter calling attention to Pippin, and then the next chapter, it's Mary. And he goes right. back and forth between these two groups. So we get Pippin's collaborators, and then we get Mary's collaborators. And it's not until the eighth of ten chapters that they finally see each other again. Right. So that's one way to capture these different groups who are committed to the same vision of conquering Sauron's evil. Right. Uh, Tolkien said in one letter that one of the themes of the whole story is the ennoblement of the humble. And here we uh, see Merry and Pippin. They've been sort of comical sidekicks. And then, but then they become important in the fall of Saruman because they get the ants to uh, get mobilized against Orthanc. And then now they both are going to have an extremely important heroic moment. So mm. they started out as kind of nobodies, the sort of extras in the story. But yeah. Just as Sam does in his role with, with uh, Frodo. So all four of them end up being very key figures in the resolution of this huge uh, problem in Middle Earth. Well, we talked in the past about how Tolkien is setting up a paradigm where things are not always clear cut. Hence the motif of signs. How do you interpret signs? The eye, because different eyes see things differently. And right again from the start of this book, we have Pippin in a position where he sees fire. And he at first thinks, oh no, it's a dragon. So he thinks it represents a threat. And then Gandalf says, no, it is the beacons of Gondor are alight calling for aid. So it's actually something that can appear to one eye as negative mm. to a more informed eye like Gandalf's. It's actually a hopeful sign. This is an interesting uh, contrast between the text and the film. Yes. That was a wonderful scene in the Return of the King film. Yeah. They had all these aerial shots of this one fire blazing up. Yeah. And then you see one in the distance just starting yeah. to burn. I went back after I saw the film and I said, I want to go read Tolkien's description yeah. of that. It's huh. like two sentences. Yep. He just says, right. yep. this fire got lit. By the way, all those places, they have place names. He had a, one oh, of them yeah. means like craggy promontory and one of them means... Mm. 
uh, tower of signaling, but it's, it's kind of a modest, uh, section in the book where it's a very magnificent section. In yeah. The film. Although I would say I don't, I don't, and we can, maybe this is a good time to talk about Denethor, but I don't like the way they handled some of the decisions with Denethor in the book, particularly because in the novel, he, he tells them to light the fires, uh, and sends people to go ask for help. But in the story, they have to, like Pippin has to take matters into his own hands and light it on fire himself. Oh yeah, himself they invented because, a lot of separate Because he refused. There. Yeah, right. so they, they really make Denethor out to be, uh, in some ways, incompetent from the very beginning. And, and Tolkien mm. does not portray him that way in the book. Right, right. Once again, because he's committed to interpretive ambiguity. And if you make it clear cut that, oh, this is someone you're not supposed to trust. This is someone that you're supposed you are aligned with that takes away from the subtlety of what he's doing. So I can can we talk about a theme that I, I felt like was very prominent in the book and it comes it comes through in several different places. Uh, but he introduces it in the first chapter when we meet Denethor for the first time. Mm. So Pippin and Gandalf come into the room and they meet Denethor and you know Pippin pledges his allegiance to Denethor and later on Mary's gonna pledge his allegiance to Theoden. Um but Denethor, he talks about the fact that he's a steward and he he points out, you know, my responsibility is to make sure that Gondor survives. They get into this whole thing again. I was like, well, yeah, but you're supposed to save it for the king should he return. It's not just mm-hmm. for you. Right. But there's this big discussion about what does it mean to be a steward? And uh, Gandalf has this line where he says back to him, all worthy things that are in peril as the world now stands, those are my care for I also am a steward. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you get this concept contrast between Denethor, who he, you know, he does take his responsibility seriously as the steward of Gondor, but he's only thinking of Gondor. He constantly says the word mine and my, right. my son. Right. It's focusing on what, you know, whatever he needs to do in order to make sure that Gondor survives. But it's really so that it survives for he and his household. And Gandalf is thinking of all of Middle Earth, you know, all worthy things are under his care. So that's a big theme about stewardship, I feel. And then, you know, you see that contrasted with uh, Eomer and Theoden and Aaron Gorn and, and how they all handle their stewardship or their task and what it means to be a leader. So mm. I thought it was an interesting thing they introduced at Denethor and they contrast him with Gandalf consistently. Tolkien does throughout the story. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you also understand Boromir better uh, because right. he's his father's son. And their first right. loyalty is the preservation of Gondor. That's why Boromir keeps saying, oh, we could use the ring to defend Gondor. And he doesn't realize that, no, it's intrinsically corrupting. You can't do that. So once you meet uh, Denethor, you have a lot better sense of why Boromir yeah. was... So right, kind of blinkered right. in his vision. And the opposite attitude that Denethor has towards Faramir. He's just I know. almost reviles Faramir and treats him like the prodigal son mm. in a way. Oh, very and much yet, so, yeah. Faramir maintains his commitment to Gondor despite this disapproving father who obviously elevated Boromir, maybe because Boromir was more like him. Mm. And we hear Denethor saying, oh, only if I had the ring, I could have used it, which is, of course, what led to Boromir's fall. Yeah, that's also he says, oh, Boromir, he would have brought me a mighty gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he knows that if Boromir had gotten a hold of it, that he would have brought it back to him. Minas Tirith. Yeah, I was going to say another theme is the oath and the allegiance that you make, you know, mm-hmm. so I mentioned the Merry and Pippin make an oath, but um, Faramir goes out and does this raid where he knows that it's, f- it's foolish, they're going to lose a lot of people and he gets, you know, mortally wounded almost, but he does it because well, I'm, I've am i pledged my allegiance to my father and this is to right. show that I trust you, but you see that oath and allegiance is a big theme in the story mm-hmm. of, um, right. you know, who, who deserves your allegiance and who do right. you give it to and, and what do they do with it? Rather, rather Rather than this idea that, oh, well, if he doesn't treat me nice, I'm not going to um, help out his kingdom. He serves a larger goal, a larger purpose. Yeah. And Pippin grew to that point. He realized that he actually had to defy Denethor's orders to have this great funeral pyre of Denethor right. and Faramir, mm-hmm. especially yeah. when right. Faramir's still alive. But he has to get to that level of, of uh, Gandalf's insight that there's a greater good here than just obeying what Denethor tells me to do. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, and you see that with the character of Baragon, which uh, I was kind of disappointed that he and some of the other characters from the story didn't make it into the movie. Here's this guy that looks up to Faramir. He's a nobody. Right. You know, I mean, he's he's a part of the, the guard that uh, has this special task, but he's a nobody among the guard. Pippin says, are you the captain? He's like, no, I'm a nobody. But in the end, he has to choose to 
fight and basically kill these stewards that are trying to light Faramir on on fire, you know, but he has to violate his oath. Right. Uh, But it's the right thing to do. Mm hmm. Gollum is mentioned only one time in this entire book, but it is his name is used to support Aaron what you have alluded to insofar as Gandalf is responding to Pippin's dismissal of uh, Gollum. And Gandalf says, let us remember that a traitor may betray himself and do good that he does not intend. It can be so sometimes. Good night. And that's a, just a little mm. foreshadowing. But once again, you can't always interpret on surfaces and say, this person deserves to live, this person deserves to die. Mm. And we're going to see uh, during our next podcast, when we bring this whole conversation to a conclusion, how Gandalf's words come true. And then we'll have a bonus uh, podcast on whether or not we like the title of The Return of the King. <laughs> <laughs> we'll spend the whole hour on that. Bad. Oh, that's true. There's an old English proverb, evil will oft evil mar. And uh, that's kind of what he's saying there, that uh, in trying to betray them, he's going to betray himself. That's another mm-hmm. thing we knew was inevitable, that somehow Gollum was going to be a part of the final fate of the ring. Mm-hmm. Everybody intuits that. And sure enough, in the, the book we discuss on our next podcast, we'll, just, we'll find out how he's right. uh, yeah. part of the fate of the ring. Right. I just read uh, uh, this great guide to... Lord of the Rings by Wayne Hammond and Christina Skull. And we talked about how Eric Gorn, because he is the king, he has the right to look into the Palantir. Oh, yeah. And he wrestles with Sauron. Mm-hmm. And it's very exhausting, but he said it was the right thing to do. Yeah. In the first edition, it actually made it into print. Gimli says, oh, you looked into the Palantir? That's not a good idea, is it? And in this edition we have now, Aragorn just says, well, you forget who you're speaking to. I'm Elisar. I'm the Elfstone. I'm, yeah. the, I'm the appointed king. Yeah. In the first edition... He says, what did you want me to say? That I had a rebel dwarf that I'd be happy to trade in for a serviceable orc? (laughs) (laughs) And uh, it's a pretty good line. But then he thought about it. He said, well, that's kind of harsh. Yikes. Mm. So in the current edition, he just bristles a little bit, but he doesn't throw Mm. out the zinger in Gimli's direction. Really? Well, and that provides a contrast then with Denethor, who also has a palantir that he looks into. And he actually sees... The truth. He sees these ships coming Mm -hmm. towards up the river, towards Gondor, that are actually the enemy's ships. And so he gives up all hope and not realizing that things aren't always the way they appear on the surface. Well, we learn that uh, Sauron, Sauron only shows him what he wants him to see. Right. So what he's seeing is the truth, but he's right. seeing a, a, a selective version. You know, he's, it's being filtered for him. Right. He doesn't see the accuracy underneath. And yeah. I, th- I think that is an insightful way to think of evil. People are just so driven by their own self-interest. They don't see the nuance of things. Oh, yeah. And, of course, later we discover that Aragorn has captured the ships and it's Aragorn coming to the rescue. Yeah. So what was perceived as evil is actually their salvation. Yeah. He really struggled with that in the composition because we want the moment of suspense of, oh, no, the Black Fleet is coming up the river. Right. Mm -hmm. And and they go, no, it's Aragorn. That's just standard. But we had to lose track of Aragorn for a long time. That's right. After he brought up the Oathbreakers. So he really originally, he had this big backstory of why Aragorn showed up and he realized that it killed the suspense. So we went back and shortened it. So we just see Aragorn and the Oathbreakers kind of leave the stage. and We don't know what happened to them. Yeah. And then they reappear at this opportune moment. It's very uh, sophisticated storytelling, very sophisticated oh, narrative this structure. Is. Yeah. The structure no, he does a good job of sort of skipping ahead and then re- rewinding and showing parts of the story mm-hmm. from a different perspective. Right. So, right. you know, later on you have the battle of, you know, Pelennor and uh, everything that happens down there. And then the next chapter we see it from Gandalf and Pippin's perspective as they look out over the city. Right. Right. You know, right. Just sort of passive participants. Right. Right. Once again, different perspectives bring to light different things. He didn't like movies, but he has a very cinematic imagination. Yes. In some ways, it's easier for someone like Peter Jackson to visualize how the film should be made 
because it's been structured almost like a screenplay. Uh Uh, All these different scenes and this intercutting between what's going on with Frodo and Sam and what's going on with Gandalf and Pippin, what's going on with uh, Mary and the the others there at the writers of Rowan. So it's, it's really an excellent interweaving of narrative strands. Okay, I have a question for both of you because there are some things that I was struggling to understand near the beginning of this book. In chapter two, we are told that Aragorn chooses to go through the paths of the dead. And so he leaves behind the rest of his troops in order to do that. And the chapter closes by saying, and the dead followed. What is going on there? Well, when the other Dúnedain joined them on the road, they're in Rowan and they're looking for Aragorn. And Aragorn says, well, you've, you've found him. And this it's, is his own right. kindred. It turns out they've been called by Galadriel. But then the, the sons of Elrond say, remember the paths of the dead. If you have to take a shortcut. And they oh. quote Malbeth the seer. Yeah, I Malbeth the seer. What's going on there? Well, once again, it's another prophecy which is going to come true. Uh-huh. And we don't know it at the time, but he's actually going to take the Oathbreakers and use them as his army when they come across the ships. Yeah. It previously, had, they had sworn that they would fight Sauron, but then they lost heart. And so now they're all these just kind of ghostly figures living underground, yeah. waiting to be freed. And Aragorn has the power to free them. When he says the dead followed, he means the army of Oathbreakers are going to follow. Remember, they go to the Stone of Erech, and he says... Oathbreaker, Oathbreaker, break me an oath. No, he doesn't say that at all. He says, this is your chance to fulfill your oath and so be freed from this kind of Mm. living dead state they're in. They're almost like the ring wraiths. So basically, if they fulfill their oath and help fight Sauron, then they will be freed from this state of being living dead. So, in other words, it's like another harrowing of hell, then. It is. It's an interesting... uh, Well, go ahead and and expatiate on that. Well, we already talked about the harrowing of hell Mm -hmm. in an earlier podcast, but this becomes even more explicit. And, of course, it's based on that one verse where uh, Jesus, on Happy Saturday, went to prison and preached to all the people who had died before Mm. him. And it became a theological tradition that the dead were given a chance to follow Jesus because now here is Jesus preaching to them and they're saying, oh, this is the Messiah we were waiting for. There's another verse that talks about Jesus freeing the captives. Yeah, that's the same one. Is that the same one? Yeah. Yeah. From prison. They call it prison, but it's where um, early yeah. patriarchs of the Old Testament. Right. Yeah, are. I was going to say, uh, theologically, there was a development in the doctrine of hell. And so right. previously, it was just sort of the grave or Sheol was ever, where everybody went after death. Right. And then the idea is that uh, that's not actually hell, hell with the capital H. It's a sort of underworld type of place. Holding kinda like, place. Yeah, kind of like the Greeks had, you know, where you had to cross the river Styx and everything. Uh, and Jesus goes and he gets those people that are kind of in like this uh, waiting room uh-huh. of the dead mm. and brings them back. So he's not, it's not the same hell that we think of sort of uh, at the end of, you know, the book of Revelation, uh, right. the pit of fire, that kind of a thing. And so, yeah, there's a lot going on there with uh, paradise and then Sheol is different in the Old Testament than we would typically think of in terms of heaven and hell. Right. Sort of a in-between places. Right, if, if right. That they didn't sense. even have the same sense of afterlife exactly. that we have. Yeah. But that whole chapter, chapter two, then gives us another way to interpret Return of the King because it said that the township and the fords of Carol. They found it deserted for many men had gone away to war and all that were left fled to the hills at the rumor of the coming of the king of the dead. But the next day there came no dawn and the gray company passed on into the darkness of the storm of Mordor and were lost to mortal sight, but the dead followed them. Yeah, he, the great company is is Aragorn and the Dúnedain, his followers, right, his right. kindred. Plus, but then, Legolas if the Kimberly. dead followed them, where do we see the dead operating after this chapter? Well, they, they come off the ships, right? They're, yeah, no. So they, they um, scare all the people. They're on the ships. Oh, so they're that on happens, the ships. No, so that happens in the movie. This is a, a a big axe I have to grind with Peter Jackson. In the novel, they go with him down to the ports and they fight this battle down down That's by right, the sea. Right. And Leg- Legolas recites this to Pippin later in the story when they're saying, hey, well, where did you go? And right. tell us about the paths of the dead. And Gimli's like, I don't want to talk about it because I was underground and I was afraid and I don't like
like that because I'm a dwarf. But he tells the whole story, and and Legolas mentions that he sees the he hears the cry of the seagulls, and he'll like he'll never mm-hmm. love trees again because you know his heart's longing for uh, the West. But anyways, they they go down there, and the dead help them fight this battle uh, with these ships, and then Aragorn releases them. Even though Tolkien says the pledges until Sauron and his, his followers have been wiped from the face of the earth, their oath won't be fulfilled. And so in my head, I'm like, what? Hang on to the army of the dead until the end of the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause, it could be of service. Exactly. Because they make he, Tolkien makes such a big deal about, well, they got 7,000 people and now they got 6,000 people and now they got less than that because these people are afraid and they're losing. I'm like, why don't I take them with you to, all the way to the end? You know, hang on to that oath. But he releases them down at the coast. So when they come up on the ships, they bring some of the men with them on the ships and the rest of them are marching and they meet them later but the dead don't show up with them at Gondor to fight on the Battle of Pelennor but they do in the movie I like that effect though that was no cool I mean it was effect. a good idea and I that's kind of where yeah you know. but I kind of want to go to Tolkien and be like why well, hang on to them you know Peter Jackson had a good idea they would have been useful <laughs> in that battle scene but then again he releases them there and it's like why not you know just hang on to them to the end uh. so that's a difference between the book and the movie but yeah on the book it just and it's told in a, in a flashback. It's not even uh, in in the current thing. Right, right. Yeah. So well, they don't actually come up on the ships uh, to Gondor in the story. So Generally it, speaking, the living dead do not make good soldiers. <laughs> they, they don't follow well. orders. You know, they don't they don't march in rank. <laughs> What Peter Jackson did then reminds me of what Coleridge did in Rime of the Ancient Mariner, where the dead rise up and mm. actually sail the ship yeah. through the ocean. Oh, right, right. Uh, well, uh, that we talked about that motif of the travel to the underworld, but Tolkien's unique in that he brings these these oath breakers out to be a part of his army. Yeah, in the light of day. We saw that in Aeschylus. We saw that in Dante. He visits the underworld, even in the silver chair. Yeah, we were so, talking about that earlier. But yeah. this is unique and that he actually goes there to raise an army of the dead yeah. to bring with him. Um, can I? Can we talk about a little bit about Eowyn and Aragorn? Because they have a very bittersweet, touching moment in uh, the second chapter, The Passing of the Great Company, mm. that I wanted to mention. Uh, Tolkien lays it on pretty thick here. Um, there's actually a passage where he says, you know, the Lady Eowyn greeted them and was glad of their coming. And then he says, but on Aragorn, most of all, her eyes rested. Mm. And he keeps uh-huh. throwing those uh, those uh, hints in there that uh, she's she's really got eyes for Aragorn. Mm. And he, I, he, you know, in his defense, he understands this, he recognizes this, but he never, in any way, shape, or form reciprocates because, you know, his heart's with uh, with Arwen. Especially, and the, again, they left that out in the book, the Elrond's sons don't show up in the movie. Very disappointing. Uh, a lot of these characters get left out in the movie, but uh, there's that reminder of, you know, like, and, and then Arwen even makes the banner for him, you know, that he unfurls when they show up at the city. Uh, but that almost romance between Eowyn and Aragorn, I think that he does a really good job of setting that up and then paying it off with Faramir. Right. And uh, I wanted to skip ahead and read a quote from the Houses of Healing. This is kind of the last uh, encounter where he shows up to heal her after, spoiler alert, she's been <laughs> wounded in the battle. And he says, this is Aragorn speaking, he says, Few other griefs amid the ill chances of this world have more bitterness and shame for a man's heart than to behold the love of a lady so fair and brave that cannot be returned. Mm-hmm. Mm. So he, he, there's a grief and a sorrow in his heart that here's this beautiful, fair woman who's been neglected in the- Theoden's house and she's brave and she could do all these great things. And he knows he can't return that love because mm. he's pledged his heart to someone else. Mm. D- just to... Uh- Talk about Tolkien's craftsmanship. When Arwen revealed the, uh, I mean, when they revealed that they're carrying the standard she made, Mm -hmm. in archaic English, thou and thee is more familiar than you. And so she says, this is the standard which I made for thee. It's very familiar. Mm. Later on, when he's talking to uh, Eowyn, she says, well, they follow thee. Why can't I follow thee? But he always sticks to you. He always sticks to the more formal. So just in terms of the underlying grammar, she's speaking very familiarly to him, but he's not responding with the same level of familiarity. Yeah, Mm. she's, it's it's almost like she's telegraphing like, hey, if you, if you're looking for a wife, when you become king, you know, you know where to look. Mm. (laughs) Well, I am enjoying how Tolkien redeemed himself from the antwives with Eowyn and (laughs) saying, she just pleads with Aragorn and I want to emphasize that she, she isn't 
pleading just because, oh, I have such a crush on you. Let me come along. <laughs> You're true. just so hunky. <laughs> no, <laughs> she is saying, if you must go, then let me ride in your following. For I am very weary of skulking in the hills and wish to face peril and battle. Yeah. She wants to contribute yeah. to this important cause. And when she's turned down, Aragorn says, what do you fear? And she says, a cage mm, to right. stay behind bars until youth and old age accept them. And that is how she feels. She is caged by her gender. Yeah. She yeah. has this power and ability and desire, but cannot break out of that prison. And then, of course, yay, Tolkien shows her later on. The only way she can um, serve is to disguise herself as a male uh -huh. and prove yeah. that she had the ability. And she is one of the people who turns the war yeah. later on because of her brave actions. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that line where he keeps telling her, reminding her of her duty and this is, you know, this is her lot in life. And she says, all your words are but to say you are a woman and your part is in the house. Right. Mm. But when the men have died in battle and honor, you have leave to be burned in the house for the men will need it no more. I was just like, whoa. I mean, mm. that's yeah. pretty rough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, she comes from a warrior culture. Uh, later on, when she talks to Faramir, he actually is a good compliment to her. Because he doesn't value valor for its own sake or heroism or trying to build mm. up your reputation. He says, I don't do it for the glitter of the sword. I do it to protect the people I love. So they have a great conversation at the end of the story where he actually kind of helps her mellow out because she's got this warrior ethic that yeah. even the women should be great warriors. Yeah. yeah. And the, the two of them together have a really rich conversation about why you would take up battle in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned that language, David, uh, but she says that she wants to go with them. They go only because they would not be parted from thee. And then she says, because they love thee. And it's yeah. clear, clear that, you know, she's, that's right. what she's saying there. Yeah, that was, that was a scene they handled well in the movie, I thought. You could yeah. tell that she was really thinking about herself. She kept saying, well, they do it because they love the... Okay, here's my other question. In the next chapter, chapter three, there is this encounter with these standing stones oh, yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> look like... Uh, um, Worn Weird away, men. featureless yeah. men with yeah. just holes for their eyes. Once again, that eye motif. Mm -hmm. And then they move beyond those and then they encounter the next set of standing stones which are, which are entirely unshaped. Yeah. So they've lost any shape whatsoever. And then finally, they encounter stones that just look like broken teeth. So what is going on there? Why this encounter with different stages of standing stones. Well, Tolkien uh, actually drew several drawings of this. At every switchback, this is a very steep mountain road, and at every switchback there's a statue. Uh, he was fascinated by standing stones in general, mm -hmm. especially there's... Uh, there's a lot of them in this story. Yeah. Right, right. Well, there's a lot of them in Europe. There's a lot of them in England. Oh, really? When Chris yeah. and I took a group to, it's not just Stonehenge or Avebury, there's dozens and dozens. Right. Oh. Uh, I had a guide to standing stones. We had 20 students with us, and it's rainy, but there's this one that's only about a quarter of a mile off the road. So I tell everybody, I want to go, would you see another standing stone? And we all go out there in our umbrellas, and it's about three feet high. It just looks like a fire plug. And it's just, but nobody knows who built it there, to and what it's just purpose. Thousands of years old. Yeah, wow. my students weren't as impressed as I was. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you have to think about the historical context rather yeah. than oh, this is going to be like a caryatid or yeah. something. Well, well, that's what he says about the Pukelmen. Like, who built them? What was the purpose of these? Yeah. Were they for worship? Were they for? And later on, he meets the living specimens. When he meets the uh, the wild men of the woods, mm. right? And uh, Khan Buri Buri Khan. He's actually, in the way that ants are personified trees, these wild men of the woods are personified rocks. They're oh. real round and low, and they have a craggy beard right, right. that looks like lichens. Yeah. And they just want to be left alone. They don't really want to get involved in human battles. Huh. They make a deal with... Uh, Theoden. Theoden, that if he, they do some scouting for him and yeah. find a secret road so they can get in behind the, the evil forces. Uh, I love the way he talks, too. I love the way he says, we have long eyes. Yeah. We are simple, but we are not children. <laughs> uh, I wish they'd done... Did they do anything out in the nope, films? not in oh, the movie. Oh, I think he's a great... Be a great not, character. To not in the, the movie. Film. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, but there actually are traditions of... Um, 
when the Anglo-Saxons took over, first the Celts and the Anglo-Saxons, there are all these wild tribesmen that predated them, the Picts and the uh, Scots and these other groups. So they had these traditions of just these wild tribesmen. It's a little bit like the way the American settlers looked at the Aboriginal peoples. Oh, gotcha. That we don't know what their deal is. They're just out there in the woods. Yeah. And so when he meets them, but interestingly, the the Woeses in... uh, Lion Witch in the Wardrobe, they're among the evil characters that gather with the witch for the yeah. sacrifice of Aslan. There's yeah. cruels and hags and woeses. Whereas, very typical of Tolkien, if they're a personification of nature, they're going to be sympathetic characters. Mm, they just want to be left alone. Very mm. true, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to ask, I could be totally wrong here, but the the all the dis- discussion of the men and the carved men and their faces and everything, it kind of reminded me of Easter Island. And, yeah, well, and the carved is, well, heads there? Well, that's a similar yeah. phenomenon. Well, yeah. but I wondered if Tolkien was aware of Easter Island, if he had seen anything about it. No, there's just it, so many of these thing. stone okay. circles in, in England and across Europe. And, gotcha. of course, he had been in Europe. So I, I imagine he knew about Easter Island. But as, as you say, these are all over England. And he liked to visit them. Remember, we mentioned uh, this mysterious place near Oxford called Wayland Smithy. Right, and right. And we went exactly, and saw it. And a lot followed of the, uh, in Tolkien's footsteps. Mm. Yeah, a lot of the um, imagery of the Barrow Whites seems to be based on Wayland Smithy. Right. Um, right. So I was also going to mention there's a, a, a phrase that Tolkien repeats throughout this book, which is uh, gloom. And he describes it in a different way in multiple times. So he's talking about the muster of Rowan. It says, Mary wondered how many writers there were. He could not guess their number in the gathering gloom. But then it becomes the the deepening gloom, uh, the ever deepening gloom. Uh, he repeats this phrase throughout the chapter, and he he repeats that word gloom and doom. Well, he's literally talking about that Sauron's forces have put up a big black cloud yeah. to try to right. obscure what's going yeah. on. And once again, evil oft will evil mar. The uh, writers of Rowan use that black cloud to sneak up behind the forces of evil. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he's referring to the great black cloud. Right, right. Uh, the shadow, the word shadow is repeated over yeah. and over yeah. again, too. And I also noticed that Theoden and e- Eowyn and Aemir, they consistently say a version of it is well or all is well. And I didn't know if that was there was any significance to that or if that's just a... Um, you know, it's just a phrase that they use, but Theoden consistently says, it is well, and then he'll greet uh, Eowyn when he sees her, you know, is, is it well? And she'll say, all right. is well. Um, and I, I wondered if there's any significance behind that. Do you know anything about that? I don't. I know in a lot of other stories, in Jack London stories, when his uh, Eskimos meet each other, they'll say, is it well with you? Okay. So that's sort of a greeting. Gotcha. Yeah, because right. yeah, of- he says, and you, Eowyn, said Theoden, is all well with you. All is well, she answered. And then she, you know, comp- yeah. comp- rephrases That just it, may well. be a generic greeting. Gotcha. Like we say, hi, how are you doing? You I doing? know in um, Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, when Oberon meets Titania, he says, well met by moonlight, proud Titania. So... It yeah. says ill met by moonlight, proud to take Oh, ill met. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that makes more sense. <laughs> uh, speaking of Shakespeare, there's a couple of Shakespearean allusions. We forgot to mention when the Ents attack Orthanc that when he was a boy, mm-hmm. Tolkien uh, read uh, Macbeth and it says, you cannot be destroyed until Burnham Woods shall march on Dun- Dunsinane. Yeah. And he loved mm-hmm. the idea of these marching woods that are going to attack a castle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then later we found out it was just men using branches for disguise. Right. And he was kind of disappointed. Oh. Like, I would have actually liked to see marching woods. Yeah. Uh, but there's another one of those in today's reading where Angmar, the, the witch king, says, uh, it's prophecy that I cannot be killed by man. And then Durnhelm takes off her helmet and it turns out it's Ewan. And she says, no man am I. And so he's killed by a woman and a hobbit. But it's like in Macbeth, he has a prophecy that he cannot be killed by any man born of woman. Right. And then Macduff kills him and says, I was from woman untimely ripped. Right. And uh, Macbeth's uh, last words were, so you had like a cesarean? Well, that's really <laughs> technical. <laughs> What a crummy prof- prophecy that has loopholes in it. I was going to say, that seems like kind of a loophole yeah. more than a prophecy. But anyway, I think that's another illusion to yeah. Macbeth. Oh, I, Macbeth. I agree with you. I think there. No man am I. is there. Well, we get back to the Siege of Gondor. This this giant cloud is covering everything, and so it, it's black, and it, it's dark even during the middle of the day. And I wanted to mention this description that he gives of Denethor at the 
the opening of the Siege of Gondor chapter, it says, there Denethor sat in a gray gloom like an old patient spider. Yeah. And I thought in light of all the references to spiders in the last story and the fact that we're uh, about to hear a report from Faramir about how he treated them and sent them up the steps to Kirith Ungol, uh, it just seemed to me like a very deliberate inclusion maybe by Tolkien to portray Mm. Denethor as a a patient spider. Yeah, that particular image is always negative and even in in the hobbit the yeah. spiders are attacking yeah i was gonna say i don't think there's a positive spider in the and Gollum is described as a spider at right one point. yes yes so yes. somebody asked tolkien do you have a thing about spiders <laughs> goes, everybody has a thing about spiders i don't have any <laughs> apparently somebody found out that he was a little boy in in south africa he'd been bitten by a spider and been very sick he didn't remember it but he remembered hearing the story oh really so some critics wonder if he's remembering the story that, that when he himself was bit by a spider oh. but he never claimed that he had any special aversion to spiders okay he said when he saw them trapped in a bathtub or a cup or somewhere he would liberate them oh so he was uh, trying to be on the side of nature okay. even when it came to spiders all right mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to ask also, there's a reference to the siege starts happening. There's the big battle and they did a really good job of portraying the retreat from Osgiliath in the story and mm-hmm. Gandalf goes out and shines the light. Uh, but there's a reference here to, they see the, um, the Nazgul and they're flying and Tolkien refers to him. Uh, he says, but now wheeling swiftly across like shadows of the untimely night, he saw in the middle airs below him, five bird-like forms. Uh, he was thinking, he admitted in a letter, he was kind of thinking of pterodactyls. He has this great paragraph on his steed, and he says, oh. some bird from bygone times has yeah. been fed fell meats and all that kind yeah. of thing. He actually was asked to speak on dragons to a, a, some school children, and he showed them a bunch of slides of dinosaurs. He really loved dinosaurs. Oh, okay. So mm. there's sort of a, uh, a the, this steed of uh, Angmar, or the witch king, is supposed to be kind of an image of a pterodactyl that survived from bygone times. Yeah, especially when they like flap their wings and it smells really yeah, bad. Yeah, and it stank. That's yeah. another one of those. We, we talk about how he changes his uh, word order. <laughs> yeah. And after all this long description, and it stank. Great prose. <laughs> so we have the Siege of Gondor. I mentioned uh, uh, Faramir goes out and, and he gets wounded. And it seems like all is doomed, all is fallen. I wanted to mention Denethor has this big conversation with Faramir. Mm. And then he sends him out and he says, you know, basically, if I come back, you know, remember me well. And he's basically right. like, yeah, well, if you come back, uh, mm. then I'll, I'll think about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you, you can see that he doesn't trust his own son. He calls, he says he's a wizard's pupil. Yeah, he's jealous that Gandalf. Mm-hmm. That Faramir trusts Gandalf more. But you can see why, because... Here, Faramir has a father who's just always privileged the older son yeah. and only trusts him and treating Faramir as a um, also ran. Yeah, once again, Denethor never gets the big picture. He's always thinking, what's good for me? What's good for Gondor? Right. Which tends to be the way Boromir thinks. So he right. resents the fact that Faramir is able to rise to a level above him, to Gandalf's level of, of seeking to protect all good things, all worthy things. Well, and that's why it's significant that Faramir and Eowyn, both of whom had been dismissed by their uh, uh, fathers as having an ability to make a difference, end up together in the houses of healing. So there's a type of parallel there because Eowyn has her older brother, Eomer, who is, you know, respected and a leader, just as Faramir has his older brother, Boromir. Mm. So there is this fascinating parallel that Tolkien is setting up between Theoden and Denethor. Yeah. And you know, Even their names are almost their mirror names images. Their names are of each mirror other. images, yeah. and yeah. they become mirror images of each other. So Den, Athor, Theoden, and then Theoden's children, the echo is in the first syllable, syllable, Eomer, Eowyn, but in Denethor's children, the echo is in the last syllable, Faramir, Boromir. So that's another part of the mirroring. And even the first time we meet Theoden and Denethor, remember, and this was a former book, the first time we see Theoden, he's just wilted like these, this withered old man in his throne and worm tongue is sitting right. at his feet. Well, th- when we meet Denethor, he 
isn't even sitting in his throne. He's sitting in a chair Mm. on the steps. So that gives us, okay, here are these mirrored leaders, but they're going to go in totally opposite directions. And we don't know from the beginning how that will work. What we discover is that Denethor, he wants to burn himself and Faramir. It's like he doesn't even... Uh, figure out whether Faramir is still alive. Living or dead, right? Yeah. Whereas we're told that Theoden develops fire in his veins. Yeah. So one is a fire to destroy himself. Okay, if I can't see the success of Gondor, I will just destroy myself. Versus Theoden, who rises to the occasion, has fire in yeah. his veins and becomes a great leader. Can I can I expand on that? There is uh, there's a line in that section in the Siege of Gondor where they're talking about the raid, and Pippin doesn't understand why you know he's sending them off to this battle, and they're wondering why you know what is Sauron doing? Why is he sending this uh, chief captain to fight at Osgiliath? And you get this insight where Denethor he says. This is Denethor speaking of Sauron, but I think it also applies to him. He says, he uses others as his weapons. So do all great lords if they are wise, Master Uh, Alfred. And then Gandalf explaining later on says about the captain of despair who's been sent to take Osgiliath. He says, he rules rather according to the wisdom that you have just spoken from the rear, driving his slaves in madness on before. So there's this idea that wise kings, at least in the eyes of Denethor, like Sauron is doing, they send other men to fight their battles for them, and they stay back, and they use, they basically pour out people that are loyal to them in order to... And sacrifice them. Yeah, exactly, and they stay in the back. Okay, so then in the next section, as Faramir is getting routed and, and they get defeated, it says, last of all, he came in, Faramir. His men passed in, and then he's carried in at the very end, okay? So... That's a very, I mean, that's like the next page, you know. So Tolkien is very clearly setting this up. Like, this, Denethor is just like Sauron. He's going to send people off mm-hmm. to do his bidding, even if they die, including his son. But how is Faramir going to handle his men on the retreat? He's going to be the last one in. And then later on, when Theoden is riding, and at the, they have the charge, I love the description here. So he's running, he's riding so fast on his horse Aemir rode there, and the white horse tail on his helm floating in his speed, and the front of the first Aorid roared like a breaker, foaming to the shore, but Theoden could not be overtaken. Mm-hmm. And so you consistently see that in the charge, no one can catch Theoden. He mm-hmm. will be the first one into battle, and he is determined to be the first one in the battle. And then you later on, you see that with Aragorn, where he he leads the charge off the ships. He's the first one off the ships mm-hmm. uh, into battle. So I just felt like that was a consistent motif that Tolkien used in the story to contrast Denethor mm-hmm. versus Theoden versus Aragorn. What does it look like to be a true king, a true right. leader. It's somebody who, rather than asking other people to do something that you're not willing to do or to send them off to do your bidding, you know, even if it goes to their doom while you sit back and wait and use them as your weapons, or are you the kind of person that, you know, leads from the front or stays behind to make sure that everybody survives on the retreat? Uh, so I just thought that was right. a very uh, clear contrast that he sets up between these different mm-hmm. characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even Gandalf in the end is, is right in the middle of the battle. He's not watching from a tower somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eomer brought that up with uh, Theoden. He said, well, maybe you should hang back. This is, and he says, well, no, if, if uh, we lose the battle, I would just be skulking in the hills. But if we win the battle, what grief will it be that I fell giving my strength? Yeah. So he explicitly uh, affirms that ethos mm-hmm. you just talked about, about leading from mm-hmm. the front. Yeah. And both of them beginning at the same point in a throne where they're ineffectual, but one rising to the occasion and the mm. other falling into degradation. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of moral arcs in this epic. You could take individual characters. You see Saruman starts out as a white wizard and then goes down. You see all the hobbits who start out as nobodies and they end up becoming heroes. But then you see Theoden rising to the occasion, whereas Denethor 
part of this problem, he's been looking at the Palantir and he didn't, he's only a steward. It's okay for Aragorn to look at the Palantir. Theoden doesn't, I mean, excuse me, Denethor doesn't have the spiritual strength mm. to do that. Yeah. Mm. It's fascinating that he can interweave so many character arcs into this epic story. Mm. Well, and on Theoden's side, again, in this mere reflection between Theoden and Denethor, so Mary is aligned with Theoden's side of things. Pippin mm-hmm. is aligned mm-hmm. with Denethor's. And Mary repeatedly talks about feeling like just a bit of baggage. Yeah. Right. And then here he becomes part of the killing of the greatest threat. Yeah. He and Ewan together because she included him on the back of her horse. So the two people that were meant to be marginalized, Ewan because she's female, Mary because he's a hobbit, are the ones that save the day. And there's all this discussion of that killing scene because Pippin has the exact knife that he picked up from the Barrows, which was made by the men of Westerness, the old generation of you of mean Mary Aragorn's people. Uh, excuse me, Mary. Sorry, Mary. yeah, Mary. Um, he picks up the uh, that exact sword and stabs the Witch King, and it says that was the only sword that could have done it. Right. But once he falls over, then Eowyn stabs him in the throat, and yeah. so it's, it's right. like the two of them Took together, them together. Yeah. were able to destroy them. Right. So it's interesting. The greatest enemies in the story are not destroyed by the greatest heroes. Right. When you get to the next section, it's going to be uh, Frodo with a little help from Gollum that brings the ultimate victory to the good side. Right. Yeah. But it's fascinating that it's not the great heroes who do the great deeds in the when it comes to the climax of the story. Well, I was going to ask you, uh, do you know anything about the mouth of Sauron? I wanted to ask if you had learned anything mm-hmm. about him. Well, Tolkien said, notice he doesn't have a name. He, only yeah. the mouth of Sauron. He's a physical person. He's another wizard. He's not a, a, a wraith. He's kind of in the ceremony category. But he describes him like a man, that, right. but, but, a, but a man that came from Numenor or right. something. Right. So he would be the equivalent of, he's sort of the Judas of Numenor. Okay. I mean, he should be someone like Aragorn and gotcha. uh, Imra Hill of Dal Amreth. I mean, they, these really noble Numenorians. But at some point, he sold his birthright to be on Sauron's side. Gotcha. So he was a human man, but he, doesn't, he never has been given a name. Uh, the, the wonderful scene where Gandalf faces down the Witch King and he says, you know, old king, you cannot enter. But then after they have this face-off, they hear the horns in the background that ride, Rowan has arrived. Mm. There's this mm. horns, 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 the riders of Rowan. That L- Lewis, when he heard that read aloud in the Inklings meeting, he wept. He was oh, just so wow. touched by the idea that they're coming to the rescue at the last moment. I also wanted to mention in terms of his prose that as Theoden is dying on the battlefield, he looks up and says, a grim morn and a glad day and a golden sunset. Mm. What, a, what a beautiful phrase to mm. be among your last words. Yeah. There are hundreds of passages like this yeah. in Tolkien where you just relish the language itself. I was going to mention another one. He says, uh, and it seemed that all things wept for Theoden and Eowyn. Mm. Uh, mm. I love that idea that not just all his people, but all things wept for right. Them. Mm. Right. Mm. Something sad and, and mm-hmm. tragic in the loss of, uh, of Theoden. Mm-hmm. Well, she... I think this has been a grim podcast, but also a glad podcast. <laughs> well, yeah, I would ultimately say. a golden podcast. <laughs> I was going to say, well, in our defense, I mean, yeah, we did kind of skip over a few things, but they do win. They do win at least the Battle of Pelennor Fields, and then they they off, they march off to well, the Black Gate, right? you know, and we end on a cliffhanger here again. Exactly, with the another, eagles appearing. Yeah, the eagles oh, yeah. are coming, and they showed up in the Hobbit. The eagle, eagles seem to be a symbol of providence. It says, the eagles are coming, the eagles are coming. For one moment more, Pippin's thought hovered. Bilbo, it said. But no, that came in his tale long ago. This is my tale, and it is ended now. Goodbye. And his thought fled far away, and his eyes saw no more. Well, and maybe that's a good place to end as we anticipate the last book. The Wade Center Podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to the Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, fast collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. 
To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.